you are gone. Thank you for Thanks. attending the Pasco School Board of Directors study session this afternoon. We're going to have a budget workshop here presented by Mr. Howard Roberts. And this study session will be um, broadcast on PSC channel 191 on Charter Cable TV and the school district's YouTube channel. All right, good afternoon, Board President Lehrman, Deputy Superintendent Whitney, and members of the board. My goal today is to provide you, as always, with a high-level review of the proposed 2016-17 budget for Pasco School District. And I say high-level, and we did a little look this year, and there are over 4,000 individual account codes just for the general fund alone. So what you're seeing is a summary of all that information. Um, and I'll be focusing primarily on the general fund. Not only is it the largest fund, but most of our operations float through there. And I'll be highlighting changes, trends that I see. Um, you can feel free to ask questions during the presentation, or you may save them for the end. Hopefully, we'll have some time if I don't get too long-winded up here. So just a way of what background, rules of the budget. First of all, it is a legal requirement. In the state of Washington, as well as most governments, the budget sets a spending limit. Uh, it also demonstrates the available resources that a government's going to use to fund to that spending limit. A budget also serves as an internal control document. You monitor during the year the actual results against the expectations that you had in the budget. It's kind of like an early warning system. You see some things that are trending the wrong way, you can make some decisions. Finally, the budget is a financial plan. Since resources are always scarce, the budget is a plan for prioritizing those resources and in PASCO's case to do that to achieve, uh, to advance student achievement. So a little look at the budget calendar. There's been a lot of time spent by the leadership budget team starting in earnest in January of this year. Most of the complex work is building a position budgeting model that basically projects our personnel costs, salaries and benefits looking forward. And this is a cooperative effort between the principals, the booth administrators, employee services, and fiscal services. A lot of information goes back and forth that way. We're refining numbers constantly. A lot of information goes through Jody Hockaday, the district's um, financial super supervisor, and so I wanted to acknowledge her today. She kind of keeps the paper somewhat sorted when we need to do that and keeps us on the right track. The process in developing a district budget is somewhat dependent on legislative action. So the 2016 legislative session this year was supposed to be a short one, expected to be finished on March 10th with very little action. However, it did require a special session. It didn't get done until March 29th. And for all that extra time, I'm going to tell you right up front, there's very little change to K-12 funding. Uh, again, it's the second year of a biennium that sometimes happens. Um, still, it's better. I looked last year. We didn't have anything from the state till June 30th, so we're doing a little better this year. You can see that the budget adoption is scheduled for June 28th, and fiscal will do what we need to to make sure the hearing is advertised in accordance with public law, with state law, and that the proposed budget is available to the public. So there's some of the requirements by state law. So, again, per state law, school districts in Washington have five major funds. Each fund operates as a separate budget accounting and reporting entity. Each fund has certain resources that it's responsible for. Each fund is restricted in some way as to the type of expenditures it can make. We've talked about these different funds in the past, so I'm not going to go through every one of them. But I do want to point out the first fund, again, because it's a general fund, and just point out that of this budget that I'm going to show you, 84% of the total amount will be running through the general fund, again, chiefly for operations in the district. And we'll go through the other funds individually as we get there. Okay, this may look familiar. This is a budget on a page. Um, it's probably a familiar format to you. It's pretty much what the state uses for one of their pages. Um, the five funds are listed across the top. Let's just take a look at the, at the general fund since we'll start there, that column. 
The beginning fund balance, and this is an estimated number, is at $26.8 million. That's based on the latest projections that we have, how we're going to finish this year. We still have two months to go, plus the accrual period, so again, it's a guess. But we're going to start at 26.8. We have revenues, talk about those in a little bit, about 203.6. And if you add those to the beginning fund balance, you get what the state defines as total resources available. This is the total universe that you have to use for general fund. Hey, Howard, can I, just a question. Sure. That 26.8, was that the 37.5 a year ago? Yeah, total fund balance, correct. I think that was, let's see, that was 8-1 of 2000. Yeah, the actual ending fund balance, right. At 15, I think it was 831 to 2015. I'll, I'll double check. I, I know we've been closer to in the 30s sometime. Okay. Um, let's see. And then on top of that, we have the expenditures that are highlighted there. We have a total there of 206.8 million. There's a couple components of that, and I'll talk about those later. But if you deduct those from the resources available, you end up with an ending fund balance of $23.6 million, almost $23.7. And it works the same way, the same logic with the other four funds, and we'll get into those as we go time, time through here. The Board of Directors here at PASCO has established a long-running record of fiscal responsibility, and that's been borne out by several successful financial and compliance audits. We just finished one of those, and the recent achievement of the district's highest bond rating ever. The proposed budget continues to adhere to these basic principles, and I just wanted to list these out for you. Um, first of all, conservative forecasting. Conservative, but I'd say realistic, both on the expenditure and the revenue side. We've got to be ready for kind of a worst case scenario. Another principle, the district attempts to keep its ongoing operational expenditures, that is the yearly day-to-day -day things that cost to run the district, with what we expect to receive from the state, federal, and local sources for that particular year. Kind of a corollary to that is we have selective use of one-time dollars, and what I mean by that is fund balance or district savings we, for one-time projects as they come along. And then finally, fund balance management, and that's really a plan, part of, part of the budget plan, but it's another plan for any resources that we might have available at the end of the fiscal year. And we'll talk about that in a little bit too. So, assumptions for the 2016-17, we'll go right into the general fund here, 2.0% enrollment growth. Now, if you look over the last five years or so, you can see that, depending on when you count things, but enrollment growth has actually averaged about 3.7%. Now, that's an average. We've had two years in that period that it has been at 2.29 and 2.27. So there's been a little variability in there. So again, we're going to take a little bit of a conservative approach and go with 2.0. We also have, this. there is state revenue to provide a 1.8% cost of living increase for those positions funded by the state apportionments formula. There's been no increase in the state allocation for benefits, employee benefits, and also we have the K-3 class size enhancement. We've used actual enrollment that we have this year and rolled it forward a year to see where we'll stand with that. Um, and on the expenditure side, we have new certificated FTEs, and again, as we usually do, we're going to place those at approximately the mid-level of the salary range. And for that in Pasco, that's about $73,000, including benefits. So those are some of the basic assumptions here. So let's talk about the changes from this budget to the last budget. Now, when I say last budget, I want to be really clear here. We passed a 15-16 budget back in August of last year, July, no, it was August. Since that time, in April, we passed an extended budget, which was actually refined for the additional costs we knew we were going to pick up. These are all comparisons to the extended budget, because that is our budget for this current year. So on top of this uh, extended budget, we're seeing an increase of $5.6 million in revenue. These are the major, major changes. I'll just talk a little bit about these. Um, 
that's about 2.8 percent above above the previous. The major increases, the first four that you see there are all dollars provided through the state through its apportionment system. That is dollars that are formula driven by number of students. I mentioned the 1.8 percent cost of living, the K-3 class reduction enhancement, and there is a small increase for non-salary items which are known as MSOC, the acronym there, and that's basically driven by a part of the state's financing funding formula that says every year there's an inflationary kicker that goes into effect. It's not a lot of money, but it is an attempt to keep up. All the other pieces there you can see for uh, alternative learning, career and technical education, learning assistance program, and that 2% growth totaled there about 1.2 million. Now below that, you see one that's going into the negative side, and that's Title I. And always when you do these comparisons, you've got to look at what happened in the prior year. So 1516, if you recall when I did the extension, talked about the fact that Title I had some additional access to some money that they didn't know they had at the beginning of the year. We call it carryover a lot of times. Those dollars were unusual. We had that one-time access for that. Right now, we're not budgeting that we're going to have that kind of revenue, so it's going to shrink back to a more normal level, if you will. Normal is probably not the right word. But it's because of that one-time blip that you're going to see a decrease there. The offset will be, in the, it will be on the expenditure side as well, because as with all grant funding, if you don't get the revenue, you're not going to spend it. So I did want to make that clear. We have levy dollars of about $1.2 million more. And remember, this is a melding between Levies are done on a calendar year basis, so it's going to be the finishing of the 2017 levy, and then it's going to be the start of the 2018 levy from January through August, which was just approved by the voters in, in February of this year. And then we have also levy equalization, a small increase there. It's not really small, but it's there. And all others, about a million dollars. Again, total of about 5.6 million. The composition, like to compare these side by side. On the left, you have the extended budget from 2015-16. You can see the breakdown by revenue. And then if you compare it to 16-17, there's very little change in the composition of the revenues. Every one of them is within 1% of the prior year. State apportionment has inched up. You can see the largest block there, the red, it's now at 61.51%. And that's continued to happen over the last several years, and largely because Although there's still the McCleary decision out there, there have been some attempts, there have been additional MSOC dollars over the last few years in particular for districts. So we're seeing a little bit more there. Federal grants are a little bit lower, that slice of the pie, just as I explained for Title I. And because of that reduction, nearly all the other sources kind of filled the vacuum and show a very small growth, again, less than 1% from the previous. So basically the same composition of revenue. There are not, not a lot has changed there. On the expenditure side, compared to the extended budget, we have even a smaller increase, 2.5 million. Now this is a net of a lot of different numbers, but I'm going to talk about the first one here, uh, 4.3 million. This is certificated, um, classified, salaries and benefits except for retirement. The certificated includes the second year of the PAE contract that we've talked about, including the benefits. It also includes other bargaining agreements that have recently come into effect. There is also the 1.8% cost of living that we talked about earlier. And there are 37.2 new full-time equivalent positions. Now some of these, 17.7 .7 are basic ed, some of these are SPED, about seven of them are that, and I'll talk a little bit more about that, but we do have some new positions that are in there. Um, we also had a very significant increase in the retirement rate, and that almost amounts to 26% over the previous amount, and that is about $2.8 million. Now, on the flip side, some of the things that are smaller than in 1516, if you recall, we had instructional materials in 1516 of $5.6 million. .9 million. <laughs> In 1617, according to the proposal, it was 2.9 million. So there's a net difference there of 2.7 less. We also have a, a smaller investment in capital projects primarily, and I'll talk about this again. 
Within the general fund, nutrition services has kind of a unique place because it is in the general fund, but if, if it has less expenditures and revenue in a given year, those dollars have to stay put aside and they have to be used for nutrition services. It's kind of unusual in that respect. Uh, the, the, the program has done very well over the, the past few years and they tend to turn those dollars into capital improvements, uh, capital outlay items as they do. We've got about $1.4 million in freezers, freezers at individual buildings, freezers a large one at Building 210. And again, that's happening this year. We don't expect that they'll have the money or the need next year. So again, that's just a comparison with last year. So smaller, smaller list for capital outlay. Howard, can you uh, explain the retirement rate increase a little more? Yes, as you probably know we have a couple different major retirement systems, teachers' retirement system and the school employees' retirement system. For a number of years, the state has been under pressure, I know this even from when I was in West Richland, to bump those rates up to make sure those plans were self-funding down the road. Um, it's not been a good time to do that with the recession because, as you can imagine, the state of Washington is the number one employer that would be hurt if you raised the retirement rates. So for a number of years, there's been a lot of political pressures from school districts and other government entities saying, slow it down, don't, don't, don't do that much. So we've had a couple small ones, but it got to the point where this was pre deemed pretty necessary that we make this increase, and unfortunately, it was a large increase. Does that answer the... Yeah, so who, who required, did the state require the increase yes, of all it's, districts? Yes, yes, yes. It's anybody who's in those retirement plans. I think it affects um, higher education too as well. So, and then judges and police officers have their own. But again, the act, state actuary makes these recommendations and then the legislature acts on them. Sometimes they don't act with the same number, but they basically caught up with it. So that's why it's a large increase. So, so all districts were required to put in the same percent, yes. some percentage of something. Okay. And I want to be totally forthcoming with this. This really took effect in the middle of this last school year, but we did not catch it all in the budget. We're, we're able to swallow it this year, but I just want to make sure that this is, this is something that started in September, I believe. So. November, somewhere in that area. And that's the trouble sometimes with retirements, trying to project what they're going to do. Some plans start in December, if I remember right, and it's always never matches with the fiscal year. So we're going to try to stay up with it now. And that's, so, that's so is a big percentage of that back payment, or are we going to see that going forward about that's going to be the, the, new, the new baseline? or the new It'll form? be the new baseline. This is a one-time hop up. Well, I shouldn't say one time until the next time they deem they need to, okay. to raise it. But yeah, it's pretty significant. Did the state pay for it? Yes, <laughs> they get to pay for theirs too, for their employees, so right. So the state paid for the salary increase for our teachers so that? Oh, I'm sorry. Miss, through the allocation model, they did provide some dollars for benefits, correct? They do provide a little so they mandate that we have to increase the, the retirement amount, but they once again don't fund the mandate. Right. We, have to, we have to do that retirement rate on all employees, not just the FTE funded by state. So for those, for those, for those FTE not funded by the state apportionment, we have to pay the full amount. Okay. So can you help me understand how our instructional materials ended up being less is it getting rolled forward? I mean, we're saving $2.7 million, or so there's a reduction in two point, of $2.7 million, right? Yes. Less the last year's investment was 5.6. This one is scheduled at 2.9. Because we put so much into it last year, it'll be less this year. So we had budgeted or expected 2.7 more than we're actually going to spend in this coming school year. Is that? No. When, if you recall, there was an agreement. Yeah. Actuals from last year versus. Yeah, it's just a comparison from one. Any other questions on this? Again, this is kind of gross, and I'm just trying to get some higher level summaries. There are a lot of other ins and outs, as you can imagine, over 4,000 lines, but this is pretty much the big ones. Okay, now I wanted to talk just a little bit more about fund balance. This, the purpose of this page is to illustrate that alignment between ongoing revenues and ongoing expenditures that I talked about. And that distinction is kind of lost in that first summary page, every, all the funds on one page. So let's, let's work through this. 
The actual ongoing revenue is the same. It's $203.6 million. However, the expenditures in this budget are in two different components. What I would call ongoing expenditures are 20309 If you deduct that from the ongoing revenue, you see that we're within one-tenth of one percent of balancing revenues ongoing to ongoing. And that's noise level. I mean, that could go one way or the other. However, if you go to the next line, we do have that one-time use of fund balance, again, the $2.9 million for instructional materials in 1617. If you take that away, you've got a total plan use of fund balance of about $3.2 million. And you can see that down below, beginning fund balance, ending fund balance, the difference is there again, magically, the $3.2 million. So what I'm saying here is this budget posits a total change in fund balance of about 3.2 million, all of which, 2.9 of that is for one time. The, it, we would have almost been in balance, I mean, ongoing operationally, very, very close. So you've seen this before, we you probably see too much of this. We've, we've walked through about the different ways you can slice up expenditures, but I did want to show you a comparison. Um, this one's by program. And you can see, again, the, blue, the large blue slice of the pie is where the largest growth appears. If you look at the gross numbers, this is basic education. And you can see that it's up about 4.7 million. And that includes all those numbers that I was just talking to you about, including 17 of the new 37 FTEs and the 1.8%. It's the fastest growth. We've gone from 56.4 to 58% of the general fund expenditures. And that's followed by SPED right below that, special education. You can see that they've gone up about 2.3 million. And that's including about seven new FTEs. As a matter of fact, if you take the first three items that all have the education next to them, which includes CTE, you add those up, all the direct education portions of the budget, that's basic, special, and career and technical education, have advanced from 69% to 71% of the total general fund budget. And that's just from the extension. All of the other pieces are fairly flat or down. An activity is another way to look at things. And that's a specific or distinguishable service performed by a school district. Again, the blue here, the largest slice, are teaching activities. And that's up about 4.1 million again. Teaching support is is down about one million. And now this is a net effect because guess where that curriculum, the decrease in the curriculum goes? It goes right there. So we actually had some increases in teaching support, which would include your librarians, counselors, nurses, et cetera. But again, if you combine the blue and the red, the teaching and support activities together, you have the vast majority of the budget. It's about almost 73%. It is actually 73% compared to 72 the year before that when I did this, and then the year before that was 71. So you see a pattern as far as where are the dollars going. Um, the yellow is other support. That would be your maintenance, custodial, nutrition services, transportation, and information services. It does exclude any of the supervisors for those groups. But you can see that has a slightly higher overall budget, but it's still right around 15% of the total expenditures. Light blue, blue principals and school offices are up. The purple um, is, is down slightly. And again, I, I hate to keep bringing up freezers, but you have to put them somewhere in each of these categories. And unfortunately, it doesn't make a lot of sense to me, but the way the state accounting manual has it, we have to put that 1.4 million in central services. So I'll tell you, it looks like we've spent a lot less in central services, and that would be great. I, we do try our best to keep those costs down, but honestly, the major difference there is one year we have a freezer purchases, the following year we don't. We did make some other cuts, though, in central services. Um, so that's why you can see without that, it's fairly flat. OK, so what items do you get with the budget? Here, here we go. On the first three objects, it's no surprise. The diff two different types of salaries and the associated benefits make up the, by far the largest portion of the general fund expenditures. They total about $172 million of the $206 million that we have for the general fund. 
Um, that means that about 83 cents for every dollar that goes through the general fund is for what I call people costs. And that's up from last year's about 81%. And again, it's up from the year before as well. So if they're 83%, the remaining 17% are for supplies, contractual services, travel and capital outlay. These are collectively, again, known as MSOCs, um, non-salary expenditures. And all of these dropped slightly in terms of gross dollars. About this. So speaking of MSOCs, so we have a new budget requirement from the legislature effective this year regarding MSOCs. Now that's an acronym again for material supplies and operating costs as I've been saying. It's pretty much everything but salaries and benefits. So the state provides an allocation for those MSOCs and basically the legislature apparently wants districts to show that they are spending those MSOC dollars, uh, non-salary dollars, on non-salary items. And if a district is using any of that money for salaries or benefits, a district is supposed to explain how that advances student achievement. So it's kind of an interesting little exercise here. But at least for this year, you can see in the rectangle, PASCO is spending its entire expected apportionment and then some on non-salary MSOC money. Again, this is a new disclosure. It's very interesting, we're not getting a lot of funding for compensation and yet we're supposed to say that it, it never bleeds over, the MSOC dollars never ble bleed over to pay for compensation. I think a lot of other districts are gonna have trouble with this, I mean, just showing it that way. And as far as I'm aware of, there is no state law that says you cannot use MSOC app, you know, appropriations for salaries. It's just been a way of funding mechanism for years. So this is a little controversial. It's brand new. We have to do it as part of the budgeting process. What, what kind of things that MSOC expenditures is, is estimated equal $23 million? Will, will that include that curriculum yes. budget for next year? Yes. Investments in technology and, you know, and then it's everything from office supplies to insurance and so even after um adding that in and everything else we're just expected to spend about a million dollars of local dollars on on materials above what the state above funds the state. Us. Yeah. Okay, fund balance management, one of the principles they talked about. So how to manage those estimated dollars available at the end of this year's operations. As I said before, at the end of the year, after the 16-17 operations, we are estimating the general fund will have a little more than $23 million in total fund balance. That's total, all the restricted pieces and everything. I'm not going to divvy those out just yet at this point. From that, now we're going to talk about those different pieces. We've talked about restricted fund balance. There are pieces that are contractually or um, grant obligated dollars that we cannot spend for general purposes. And, and the, we actually have to report this to the state auditors. So we take an estimate. We think we're going to have about $3 million of that fund balance that will not be expended, it will not be expendable. We also have for the direction of board, 5% of revenue, that's about 10.1 million. If you take those two numbers from the 23.6, you end up with about 10 and a half million dollars. And that money is available for assignment. This is the least restricted category of the fund balance, but it does represent the intention of the board and management to put dollars aside for future items. Kind of a marker sort of thing. Um, you have there in front of you, and hopefully you've seen this before, the recommended assignments by senior staff, and you can see that the first four are basically, or the first three basically, are, are for bigger ticket items and their eventual replacement. Um, I want to talk about the bus replacement a little at 500,000. That's not fully funded. We've done what we can there. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that when I do transportation vehicle, but it will help out. Um, a goal there, again, is to get everything 25 years or older off the road. So you can see the various different pieces there. Um, for example, the computer replacement is on a four-year cycle for most items. Mark Garrett keeps that up. We've also got uh, the instructional materials, again, 
We're going to have to look at putting aside dollars as we go on for eventual replacement. We've got student housing. This is a little bit of a catch-all, but we've used this in the past for a number of different things, primarily if we need to transfer dollars out for uh, portables. And so that stays there. Future legislative action. You've all heard the term levy cliff, but effective January 1st, 2018, unless the, unless the state government takes action, we're looking at a $3.4 million loss in levy equalization. Um, there are some promises being made by the state out of this legislative session that that won't happen unless they re redo the whole state funding plan, but we'll see how it goes. Right now, I think it would be wise to set some dollars aside in the eventuality that we do have to come up with that at least for one year. So again, the assignments are really flexible. They're based on estimates of what's going to be left of estimated revenues and estimated expenditures. But it does give you a, a way to earmark things for the future. Um, I would take a time out here because the next time you'll see those, it would probably be during the final budget presentation. Now, I'm wondering if any of you had a chance to look at those and what you thought of those, if there were any, if there's a consensus on some changes, we can certainly bring that back. What can so when you say, or when we put in there 17, $1.75 million for computer replacement, mm -hmm. how many years would we expect that to be spread over? Is, um, it, is it a four year? It's a four year replacement cycle. I don't know if it's exactly even though, because I know we bought a clump like three years ago. So I, I would have to talk to Mr. Garrett as far as what the schedule is for that next few years. I, I want to say if we have that and we have 1.7 in the regular budget next year, he said he needed 3.5 approximately for 17-18. Uh, but so I can a, check with him and get those. I'm just curious, and, and it's a more global question, like instructional materials, $3 million. What, how do, is that just for one year out after this, or is it for spread out over three years? Is that documented anywhere? or? I don't know that it's documented. We're still in the process of learning a lot about those yeah. costs, and this is the second year. But I do, in my mind, I have it fixed as kind of like a depreciation schedule. You'll set aside so much every year. You know, in six years, for example, we need to pay six million instead of 5.6 for the ELA and math. Probably would be wise to start setting money aside so we don't have to take the whole hit yeah. one year in expenditure budget. And. Whether it'll work out exactly, we don't know yet, but that's kind of a shot right now to, again, earmark some things. And again, this can be flexible. If we need to move money, these we definitely can. It's just supposed to be what's coming up in the next year's budget, not in necessarily this one, that we're going to need some dollars for. So, Howard, so we're really not saying that that $10.5 million would necessarily be spent in the next year or two years or that's the amount. We're just trying to, you're just trying to give an assignment like, it, for example, if you had a rainy day fund in your house, you'd say we're setting aside $2,000 if our car breaks down or something. You're trying to name some of the items that, that you're saving away for. Now, it's completely possible that we could afford that with our other um, with our regular fund, if our revenues increase, so exactly. you're just trying to assign some of that. And what you're saying is the three million and the ten million, we really just we need that as in a lump. Just we have to say that in case whatever happens, and we're just trying to make a suggestion or earmark for these things if it became necessary. But we're not saying that this money is going to be spent in any period of time, or that it would even be needed. You're just is that correct? That's nice. correct, and okay. it's definitely not going to be three million on the nose. I, I will tell you that too. I mean, it, again, it's. I had an accounting professor, and I thought this was really wise. He said, when you would look at financial statements from the larger firms, you know, you, you start at the back and you take a look at things. And if someone were to start at the back of our budget and take a look at this, they could see well, what kind of pressures are going on for Pasco School? <coughs> you could see those right up front. And to me, that's a good indication. Sometimes in the rest of the budget, stuff gets kind of lost. You know, it doesn't change much from year to year. But this just, again, it signals the intent that there are some big ticket items that you don't want to absorb in one year's budget if you can help it. Yeah, and, and desirably, we wouldn't have to use that, correct? I mean, we don't want to. It's not desirable for us to go from a $23 million uh, ending fund balance to a $13 million in two years. Where our hope is that we'd be able to keep a robust 
Yeah, and where that is, you know, we're always going to keep, you know, hopefully about 5% for the contingency, as you said, rainy day. But on top of that, you generally have a, it's like a savings account. You might save for a special purchase that you know is going to come up that, you know, in a couple of years so, or a year or so. Are we still doing bus replacement? Well, I, that's yes. probably in the transportation. We're going to do some bus replacements this year. Yes. Yes. We, we have a fortunate situation. I'll talk about that. Right. But yes. So... But this is kind of looking forward again, how we're going to keep it up down the road. And um, any thoughts about this? Any heartburn about these numbers? Again, actually, these can be changed later on in the year if the board wants to. For the state of Washington's purpose, they want us to report that 10.5 million as assigned revenue. This is more of an internal kind of guide, um, and it would be our recommendation as staff. Last question I have uh, uh, on still. Where's Kyle? Gave me a bad one now. Um, I always joke with him about that. So the just this seems like a good area to review this. So the previous we'd gone uh, there was about 26 million. We took three million out of that and put it towards curriculum, correct? So we correct. had been at 26. Now can you briefly explain the 26 versus the 37 that I think Mr. Christensen had said thrown out earlier? Mm -hmm. Explain the difference between those two numbers. I can. I, I will tell you some things off the top of my head that have affected that. I would, maybe I could bring back kind of a, okay, a yeah, little bit I'm more just, you know, detail I, so you could I'm see. I'm just trying to pull out big level numbers. So I pulled out yeah. the 26 million. We devoted an extra 3 million essentially of this, mm -hmm. our fund balance savings account, whatever you want to call it, for that big curriculum purchase. Mm -hmm. But I, I, I'm not grasping right now in my head where this 37 million to the 26 million. What's the part of that? Right off the top, we remember we did the salary. other one time. We did 5.9 million in curriculum this year. So there's six of it right there. And then we did have the new negotiation. The new salary. That's and we did have a transfer out a couple of years ago for capital okay. projects. So the, off the top of my head, those are going to be your three, three yes. major items. Plus, it's just been darn tough to balance operationally we've been able to do it but haven't had a lot left over you know and things so off the top of my head those are the three big items okay so i think just the thing to be careful of i'm just looking at numbers here previously it was 37 34 26 23 mm -hmm. i'm seeing a trend here and and that's not all bad i don't know that we need a lot of money that, that we need to be carrying a lot of money but but at some point, we've got to realize that, hey, we're, we can't uh, continue this trend indefinitely. Yeah. So and, and yeah. this fund only grows as, as we, I mean, there's no budget bucket that grows this revenue. fund, or no revenue bucket that grows this. Exactly. This is all savings at the end of the year. Gosh, we didn't spend this. Right. We'll move it's it into the net results of your operations for the year. And what you have at the beginning point is your net results from operations for the last, right. you know, 100 years that have built up. And right. so once you use that, it goes right. away and you just well, have to accrue it as you go on again. Very good point. Yeah. So I think the, the main question, the big picture question we ask is, you know, how much do we save away and how much do we spend on something like curriculum? In my mind, that was a very good investment. and definitely worth uh, going down for that amount but the question really we have to ask ourselves is how much do we save away and how much is spent towards certain needs uh, that we need to address as a district and then where can we fund those sometimes we can get them through the regular operating budget we have to re prioritize stuff in a given year but these type of items usually you you can accommodate those all in one year the other thing is that that's our new fund balance. That includes everything. That includes that restricted fund balance that we have. The three that million in this case is three. Yes, and it also includes any encumbrances that are in the pipeline. And last year that equaled about three and a half million dollars. Are those not shown here? Do we know? They're not shown here because in this case we're we're assuming there is no carryover for simplicity's sake. I'm saying we're gonna spend hundred percent of our expenditures and we're gonna get hundred percent of our revenue. When the year end actually happens, what Jody's talking about, the auditors say, Okay, you didn't maybe spend all your budget, but okay. do you have encumbrances okay. that are still due out there? So it is so slightly this different. Could, right. So that thirty seven million did which is different than these restricted fund balance. So when these numbers are finalized, even if they come out exactly like this, the end at the end of the P 
period, whatever that is, there's going to be some that are, what was the term, encumbrances, or, that are going to be added back into this. Yeah, it could end up, yeah, it could end up higher, could end up lower. But again, I'm going to assume everything's going to get spent, right. whether it's encumbrance or whether it's. Right, but in that 37 million, that was, that included encumbrances. That had more buckets in it than this one does. And I, I tried to do it this way because I think there's been some confusion. So I went straight to this is total fund balance. And then we're just going to talk about at the end of the year how it might be apportioned. So. Anyway, we'll see how we do when we close our books and we'll see how close we come to that. Um, moving on to the other funds, we'll start with capital projects. You can see we start with $23.7 million there. And a reminder, these can only be used for capital uh, construction and furnishing of new buildings, site acquisition, prep work, that type of thing. And you can see for revenue, pieces here. We've got stated construction assistance of $2.1 million. That's basically the match for the Pasco High um, Library, or uh, excuse me, Science Classrooms project. We've also got some impact fees and interest in others, totaling about $3.3 million. I skipped this part. It's very important to note this budget, as presented here, does not assume passage of a 2017 bond issue. And historically, the way we've handled that is if it does pass, we'll bring it back as an extension to you folks with all the revenue from the bond and here's the projects that we're going to do. It'll fit nicely with that, but we don't want to assume that in this particular exercise. So it's net of those items. So out of that 3.3, we have total expenditures of 22.7. This is what happens. You can see the fund balance going down dramatically. That fund balance has a lot of bond proceeds in it from 2013. We're finishing up those projects. So this is not unusual for capital projects to drop pretty steadily. Let me show you what those projects are. In the 22.7, Mr. Marsh works carefully with me. Um, capital projects can extend, and they almost always do, over multiple fiscal years. So this list contains only that portion of the expenditures that the district expects to expend in 2016-17. Um, those under the heading of 2013 bond projects should look familiar as these are the remaining projects and about the amount we expect to spend on those again in 1617. Um, under the other capital projects, we have four portables and that's basically the same number we've purchased this year. Again, it's, it's an estimate at a slightly escalated cost because of inflation and those would be in place before the 17-18 school year. So again, we're kind of looking forward here. Land purchases and property purchases, I don't have that broken out, but I think you might recognize that number. That's things that we know of right now. We want to have the expenditure capacity for those. And then finally, design work. That's the preliminary work for elementary 16, as we've talked about in the bond scenarios. That would allow us to meet that expedited timeline for front funding and opening that school. And that is, um, that is should that bond pass. That's what those dollars are for. Any questions about capital projects? Debt service fund. This is kind of just what it sounds like. Um, the source for this, the revenue, is actually property tax collections. That portion of your bill that is, uh, you know, is sent to the Pasco school districts to retire bonds. These are all approved issues. Um, so the tax collections come in and they're expended by the county. They pay for the district's debt as it matures during that year. And you can see the district spent, expects to expend about $10.4 million in principal and interest. Um, that's the portion of its outstanding bonds that will come due in 1617. ASB, Association of Student, Association, Associated Student Body. Collections are primarily from fundraising activities, and they have been for concessions. That's starting to change a little bit for both clubs and athletics. In turn, these are spent on a number of student items with student direction. So you see the various categories there, the, all the collections for revenue, and then the different types of expenditures. This is a compilation of all the individual school building budgets that are submitted and reviewed, and we put those together. We see no major increases as far as expenditures that are out of the norm for any building. We did, we have noted, and for quite some time, I think I've been 
kind of putting that in the monthly update that we've seen a real drop off in concession revenue and that has to do with the changes in the federal law as to what type of items you can serve it for concessions at what time of day and it's it's been pretty tough on this particular fund and you i know you've heard about that so So you're talking a significant impact to that, that revenue source. Yeah, so that was brought up at a recent board meeting by a number of students. Could we could you just report briefly? I know you guys met with them and just try to figure out how to address that and what was decided. Sure. So Ms. Cloud and I met with both of the leadership um, classes from both of our high schools and um, we're offering some assistance from the district's perspective, we're, we're gonna um, be providing some additional revenue to both of those ASB um, budgets for this year while we at the same time encourage the schools to um, explore a variety of different options for um, raising revenue for that. Um, it, we also met and got a kind of a context for um, I know that there was some information shared um, in terms of the overall size of the what looked like the overall ASB budget was fairly large. Like I think one of them was, you know, um, like four hundred and sixty-five thousand dollars. That bottom number is all of the different ASB budgets. The budget that the the students that you, you heard from were talking about was just a small portion of those dollars that were designated for other things and so um, they did outline that things like the um, vending machines it was a significant impact to their 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 budget and they were having a difficult time maintaining the programs that have become very important to both of those schools and so for us this was a nice common ground approach of let let's at the district office provide you some revenue support for a year while we explore what some other options might be so that we can maintain the high quality of the programs that those students are running for the student body and um, both schools did a phenomenal job of outlining um, their financial position and I thought man I should I wish they they could have taught me how to about how to run a budget they um, were very impressive and and both very very um, patient and, and willing to answer our questions and provide us a context so that Glenda and I could uh, make a decision that we felt like was a nice common ground for this year while we explore a variety of different options long term for them. Okay, so the, their main proposal, their main proposal of increasing the cost from $20 to $30, we were saying we're going to, we'll help you out for now and let's explore that in more detail, maybe another option and we're going to keep it the same for this year. Correct. Okay. Correct. Just if I could to back up what Ms. Whitney is saying, if you look at this expense, this is from all the buildings, including the elementaries, but you see the portion she's talking about is the general student body piece, and that's 612. That's about only 15% of the total expenditures. So you can see it's, there's a lot of expenditures going in other ways, and so you, you, you want to take a look at how that's, that's allocated. Okay, transportation vehicle fund. First off, we get revenue. It's a depreciation formula. We get that from the state in August. We're expecting to get about 60,000 more this year than we did last, combined with the beginning fund balance. We've got enough money that we think we can make the below expenditures, and you can see those listed out. We've got buses just basically to handle growth. There are five buses, and I can't remember, I believe two of these are special needs, either two or three, all right? can't recall off the top of my head combination we've got some vans in there this year and then here's the piece that I was talking about we, we kind of got it was kind of fortuitous this will also allow the district to buy two new trip buses those are the ones with the larger bays underneath that you use for trips and I understand that you can put a uh, an actual pole from a pole vault in there that's why they have to be so big I'd never thought about that before but at any rate, those are, those are there, um, and these two happen to be, according to Mr. Hernandez, the oldest buses in the fleet. They are the two that are over, gonna reach over 25 years, just the way that things happen. So if we replace those, we've got our buses for one year, we're all 25 and under. So the problem is the year after that, 25 years ago, we bought nine buses. So, so that's why I said the 500,000 in the assignments isn't gonna cover that, but 
again, this fund's doing a little better than we thought. We're getting a little more depreciation money. Maybe we can find a way to work that. It does start at a dent in things. Um, and maybe we'll just have to smooth it out for a number of years till we get to the 25 again. Um, at any rate, the transportation vehicle fund balance is expected to drop by about 373,000. Still leaves it with a pretty good ending fund balance and there is no transfer from the general fund this year, which is a little unusual for this fund. It's, it's been able to support the need for growth. So we hope that can continue. Okay, just to recap, here's the one page budget. The resolution that will come with this, uh, the final hearing will, will actually contain each of the funds uh, listed and then just one number the number that's highlighted in yellow for each fund. That's your total expenditure, that's your total appropriation above which we cannot spend more unless we were to pass a budget extension before we got to that point. Doesn't do us any good to pass one after we've got there. So that's the legal limit of expenditures for 1617. And just to recap, I guess some of the points that I wanted to get across. You see there's been a real marginal increase in state funding for K-12. It's not that unusual. It's the second year of a biennium. It's kind of a supplemental budget. And you can definitely see that the proposed budget is becoming increasingly weighted towards salaries and benefits. And this year that's given to the COLA and the retirement increases and then just the plain growth at additional positions we need to add. Um, the budget continues also to increase the composition or the, the uh, portion of the expenditures spent on education programs and the teaching and learning support activities. The proposed budget is in line with the principles we've established over the years by the board and the budget remains, retains the 5% reserve in our revenue and reserve, 5% of revenue and reserve it contains some investments in capital and more importantly, it sets some dollars aside for the future replacement of those items. And finally, uh, there are gonna be some major issues, as you all know, for the next legislation, and this next legislative session to work out. PASCO is not alone in expending the vast majority of its general fund revenue for people costs. And with the legislature's continuing kind of reluctance to address the underfunding of education compensation, the over-reliance on local levies for funding for basic education requirements is gonna continue. And that makes it very difficult for all districts to kind of plan more than one year in advance because there are a lot of significant unknowns with this levy cliff, for example, as to what kind of levies or levy equalization dollars we can expect to receive. And it is even more unnerving um, knowing that from all accounts, we're hearing that the next legislative session will be lucky if it gets done in the summer. So what you may see, honestly, is an estimate of an estimate of a budget thrown up under the best scenarios we can just to get one done by August 31st. And we may have to extend it once we know what the legislature is gonna do. I hate to do that, but you know we'll have to see how it's gonna work out. Um, so with that kind of cheery note, um, again, I think this is a, a reasonable budget. It accomplishes the goals that are, that are set out um, and it keeps a consistency with passport practice. Um, I did want to remind you again of the next steps. Um, this is a study session, again, the broad stroke view. What we've done in the past and I'd like to continue to offer it is if you have some questions, that either you don't think about now or you want some more detailed information about any part of this budget, Jody and I'd be glad to talk to you. If you can you know, give us a call, send us an email probably in the next week or so because we're gonna have to turn this around again, but we'd be, we'd be glad to talk to you. I think those have gone fairly well and <coughs> we felt good about the interaction there. Um, again, because it's so complex and full of details, um, we are gonna make all those details available. They will be posted on the district's website. This is what's called the F203, the state uh, submittal. It is very detailed. I don't, how many? F1. F203 is uh, the revenue calculation and the F195 is the actual document. And how big is the F195? The F195 is. Yeah, it's, it's at least 100 pages. So, but it will be on there with schedules and whatnot, and it will be made available to the public as well as will this presentation in any summary version. So with that, um, I, 
you know, I'd like to help you in any way with the understanding of this overall picture. If there's any questions that you have, again, it's just kind of to improve your comfort level with what's going on with the, with the budget for next year. I, I'm glad to say in some ways there's not a lot of huge changes. We've had some major changes the first couple of years I were here that were adverse and they were tough to get over. Um, a lot of this is fairly similar and fairly stable. So with that, anything else you could come up with today that you have questions? Thank you, Mr. Roberts. Thank you, Ms. Hockaday, for all the work that you guys put in there. And as a board, we'll look forward to having a budget hearing and adoption on June 28th. Between now and then, we as a board will uh, make sure we get with you guys on any additional questions that we have. So thank you again for all the work. And we will have our regularly scheduled board meetings starting at 630. Thank you.